Hey guys, how are you? Let me know. Sound check. I'm listening. I'm, I don't know. I just read a comment saying, so hype, it's like Christmas. So you got me playing. Hey, Middle East for Christ, I love you. Do you see what my topic is? Satan, anointed cherub, Job, and Ezekiel. The first thing you do is ask me to talk about a passage not related to the topic. Only an Assyrian guy would do that. So this guy said it's like Christmas. So, And by the way, hit the like button and subscribe. Okay. What was I saying? Yeah, this guy said Christmas, so I got the John Lennon song in my mind. So this is Christmas. What have you done? Pray, pray that the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ will help me to get my health back, to get healthier, to become more handsome, but more importantly, to be holier, to truly walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, to glorify Jesus Christ in obedience, worship, you know, not just to be lip service. But it's exciting to be with you again. Yes, L.A. is phenomenal. Keep praying for this precious brother, Idiotai Apologetics. Do subscribe to his channel. Pray for him, his lovely family, his wife and daughters, his mother. Pray the Lord Jesus will provide for their needs. Pray the Lord Jesus will enable him to continue to do ministry and that I can disciple him for the glory of Christ because he's on fire for the Lord. And he and his family have been nothing but gracious and hospitable to me, allowing me to stay here free of charge, serving me for the sake of Jesus. Yep, I'm in California till September 15. I may take one trip to Arizona for a few days. We'll see. So if you guys are in Arizona want to see me, I'm free now. The Eastern Convention is over. So I got a lot of time. So can you guys pray that during this time, God will show up in a miraculous way, fight for my children and I, save me from this pressing tribulation. Within 60 days, I need the Lord to show up and save me from a corrupt judicial system so I can continue to do ministry. Pray that I get closer to the Lord Jesus here, be more worshipful, and also be disciplined enough to continue trying to get my health back, right? I really need your prayers, right? Before I even begin the session and pray, I do want to say something for those of you who comment, who comment in the comment section of the videos. Okay. I see why people like James White disallow comments. The comment section has been disenabled because there are some people here who sit and will post reams of comments. What I say, what I mockingly refer to as 50,000 word posts, writing books, assuming that I have nothing to do but sit and read through the comment section. Here's how you can get my attention and here's how you can get my attention to block you. If you want me to consider a position, do not bombard the comment section. Please listen to this. I really want to be a blessing to you, not a curse, and I want to serve you, and I do want to hear what you have to say, but let me tell you how not to get my attention, please. And I say this, and I'm trying to be gracious by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? I don't know if you guys are aware, but I write pretty much all day. I got into full-time ministry in 1999, teaching the Bible and writing for the website Answering Islam. The last thing I want to do is read reams of comments because I don't have the time. And this comes from a gentleman who likes to write a lot. But because I'm writing most of the time or researching, I am tired of having to go back and read comments. That's why I tell people, if you have a question, do not write a comment. Contact me. Say, hey, I have a question. And I'll tell you, here's my number. Call me. If you're local, if not, we can use, you know, Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp because I do not have the patience or time to read lengthy comments. Please understand. Some people think that because they're writing reams of comments that they're actually refuting an argument when they're not. Because most of the comments, because I've glanced at them, it's nothing but fluff, either red herrings, straw man, shameless misrepresentation of the position I'm articulating. And shameless butchering of the scripture. So I'm going to block you. If you don't want to be blocked from my pages, guys, please listen. Because I'm trying to help you and I want you to help me to I can be a blessing to you. If you don't want me to block you from my pages, do not write a post that's 50,000 words. A book length response, especially multiple posts. There was a gentleman who was trying to refute my case against water baptismal regeneration. And all he did was copy and paste reams 
from whatever website. And I challenge him. I said, here's my email. Challenge me. Let's have a debate. But for now, you're blocked. So, guys, please help me to help you. Do not write lengthy comments because I'm not going to read them. Don't waste your time and mine. I'm not going to read them. Okay. Lord bless you, sister. Is that clear? Can you guys understand how not to get my attention? How not to get me to consider your position? I just want to make sure. Is that clear? So help me to help you and don't do this stuff, right? And with that said, I do want to give a shout out to all my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus who not only pray for me, and your prayers are the most important thing for my ministry. Prayers are more important than financial support. Not that financial support is not important, but praying to an infinitely rich God who's more real than we can imagine is more effective than financial support because there are people who cannot support financially, but they can support us by getting on their knees and crying out to the triumph God who is infinitely able to meet our needs. So I thank you for your prayers and even your fasting. I would appreciate you fast for me and my daughters. And I do want to thank those of you who are partnering with me via Patreon and other venues. Because again, like I said, the most important thing is that you cry out to the triumph God to preserve us in ministry, to help us to be holy, to delight his heart, to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, and to provide for our daily needs. Because he is the one who's rich. He is the one who moves your hearts. He's the one who provides for you financially and moves your hearts to support us financially. So apart from the triumph God, you wouldn't be here and you wouldn't be supporting us. So everything good is from him. Even when you support ministries, support me. That's because the spirit is moving you to do it. So all glory to the triumph God who stirs up your hearts to partner with us. So with that said, I do want to thank all of you who are partnering with me regularly via Patreon and other means. The Lord Jesus knows who you are. Forgive me for not reaching out to you. It's not because I don't care for your support. I truly do. It's not because I don't think you're important. It's because I am swamped with responsibilities. Not only trying to research, read attacks on the faith and how to respond to them, or read certain books to see whether they agree in regards to a specific interpretation of a particular passage. Also, the trials I'm going through, you know, concerned about my two angels, my daughters who need their father in their life, right? So please do not be offended if I don't respond to you. You know who you are and your reward is with the Lord Jesus. Thank you from my heart and Lord bless you. And keep praying that more supporters will partner with me so that I don't have to worry about that end of the ministry, the finances, so I can just focus on studying, researching, teaching, writing, and just living for Jesus and worshiping the Lord. So I just want to thank you guys. You know who you are. Thank you. The chime God richly bless you. Right? So thank you, King of Kings. We need it. I need it. Right? Pray that the Lord who began this work in us and me will finish it for his glory and that we never fall away. With that said, because people have asked me to expound on what the book of Job says about Satan, and what Ezekiel 28 says about Satan, if it is about Satan, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to fill me. Right? No, Zena, see, no one is here again, Zena. Notice what the sister loves me and she means well. I should have done the David Lynn conference to get your name out there. No, I shouldn't have. David Lynn is compromised. I just went at it with him on his Facebook page. We went at it and it wasn't very pleasant, right? Instead of responding to me, he basically accused me of being ungracious and rude. And on his Facebook page, he said that Marcus Rogers was nicer than me. For those of you who don't know Marcus Rogers happens to be, and I don't want to advertise for him, he is a leading oneness heretic and a deceiver and an agent of Satan who's trying to butter up to Trinitarians because he just did a video not too long ago where he says he wants to get Trinitarians and oneness to work together. That's his motive. He wants the Trinitarians to drop their guard and embrace oneness heretics who worship a false god as brothers and sisters in Christ. And David Lynn is facilitating. Mark my words. If the Lord does not convict David, um, David Lynn, he's on his way to apostasy. Go to his Facebook page. I went at it. And ironically, a wicked agent of Satan, a female oneness, was attacking me, defending him. And he claims to be a Trinitarian. 
Go watch his post. The questions he's asking, he's asking questions about the nature of God to confuse Trinitarians and giving a platform for oneness heretics to come in and praise him and preach their false gospel and promote their wicked satanic God. This is why I want you to be careful of that man. I called him a wolf. I did. You can go to his Facebook page. I go, you're a wolf in sheep's clothing. And here's why. Because he has no discernment and he's opening up the door for oneness heretics to come in and embrace Trinitarians and mislead them. But here's the problem. Because he went to jail, now he's become, right, a hero. It's what I call the martyr's complex. Oh, he went to jail. He must be wonderful. No. There are Muslims who are in jail because their governments threw them in jail because of their fanaticism about Allah and his messenger. Does that mean that they're wonderful people? You have Joe's witnesses who have been in jail, continue to go to jail, and have been killed for their false belief. Does that mean they are heroes of the faith? Mormons. I mean, I can go across you know, the board. Every major world religion has its adherents who are zealous enough to suffer and even die for their false god and their false religious view. That doesn't make them he heroes. That makes them deceived and deceivers. Okay, and see, notice David Lynn attacked me saying, you're mean, you're ungracious, you're rude, and who cares? I could give a damn what you think about my attitude because it's not about me. It's about the glory of the chime God, and I will go after you and expose you as a wolf. I'm sorry. And he praised Marcus Rogers. And Marcus Rogers is so nice. He's much nicer than you. So a son of Satan who worships a false god, who wants to deceive Trinitarians to embrace this false god, because he's nicer than me, proves exactly what? Proves exactly what? Did you know what church history says, guys? Do you know what church history says about Arius and Athanasius? Did you know, according to church history, Arius, who taught that Jesus is the first creature of God, they say he was one of the nicest, sweetest, most attractive individuals you would meet. You know what they said about Athanasius? Now, again, don't quote me on this because this is what I heard. I'm getting it secondhand, so God forgive me if I'm giving misinformation. They go that Athanasius was rough to look at and very rude and arrogant. Now, folks, who had the truth? The guy who looked nice and was charismatic and humble, Arius, or the guy who was rugged, looked rough, was you know hard to look at and mean? And let me show you why the children of Satan come off as nice. Let me show you why the children of Satan come off as nice. Let me give you a biblical basis. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15. Arun, the Bible said there'll be a great falling away as the day of the Lord Jesus approaches and gets nearer. The Bible says that in 1 Timothy chapter 4. But let's read 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15. So David Lynn has been ex from my book. He's no hero. He has no discernment. And he's an agent of Satan opening the door for one of heretics to come in right and ravish the flock right now watch him go on a crusade to attack me personally i don't care let him attack i'm attacking him because he's not zealous for the triune god and he's being used of saint to open a door for one as heretics now let's read second corinthians 11 13 and 15. let's read second corinthians 11 13 and 15. why do people like marcus rogers who breach a false god worship a false god seem so nice in contrast to let's say david wood who's a jerk and he's my jerk and i love him and hopefully the day will come I can get about a thousand people watching me. Okay, here, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15. Read with me. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now notice, this time about the false apostles used by Satan. Notice 11, 14, folks, read with me, right? And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, verse 15 is the key. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, you would think a man like David Lynn, who's supposedly an evangelist and knows the Bible, would know that Satan empowers his servants to give the appearance of being ministers of righteousness, being holy, being humble, being gracious because that's Satan's way of disarming you. And you think David Lynn, of all people, know this because he preaches the gospel. How naive, in fact, how foolish and how stupid he is to say, Marcus Rogers is nicer than me. And that proves exactly what? That proves exactly what?
So he's nicer than me. Therefore, it's okay to invite him to your conference and give him a platform to preach his false message so that you give them credibility to this heretic, this wolf, so that people say, well, hey, David Lynn is a true Christian. And if you invited Marcus Rogers, then that means Marcus Rogers must be all right too. Watch how the Lord will chasten and shame and discipline David Lynn for this wicked compromise with a false Christian. Marcus, you can contact me via email. Send, send me a message, email, samshmn at yahoo.com. Samshmn at yahoo.com. You with me there? You can contact me. We'll talk about it. But okay, folks, I'm sorry. People are going to think I'm nasty. I'm rude because, again, I've been upset with James White for his ungracious attitude towards brothers and sisters in Christ. This is different because you have a man opening up a door and giving a platform for anti-Trinitarians, oneness heretics, right? This is different. We're not talking about who God is, the very heart of our faith, right? So I'm going to speak out against him. I will not support this man. Thank the Lord Jesus. I didn't attend his conference. Thank you, Lord, that he saved me from that. And can you guys keep praying for me that I never compromise when it comes to the core doctrines of faith, who and what God is? You don't get more core than that, that I never compromise and ask the Lord to save me from falling into sin and scandal, to never shame him, but to walk in holiness and purity and love and devotion. Please, because I'm not better than these men. And if they fell, fell, I can fall too. I need your prayers that the blood of Christ will cover me. He haven't had the audacity to say, the Lord discipline you. I go, the Lord doesn't listen to a wolf like you. The Lord discipline you. And go on his Facebook page and see. We had a war. And he still says, well, no, I believe in the Trinity. I go, no, come on, condemn oneness. He justified it by saying, well, there are things in Roman Catholicism you don't agree with. But would that stop you from inviting Roman Catholic on stage? Anyway, so two wrongs justify, or one wrong, one wrong justifies another wrong in his mind, right? As the old saying goes, two wrongs don't make a right. I crown you, you are incredible. I have no idea. It's not another thing I want to comment, some people are telling me to ignore the trolls because it becomes a distraction to them. That's what I keep saying. Remember I said, help me to help you. So don't be a stumbling block. When you comment, when you argue, when you fight, when you take shots at me, or when you say something, I have to then treat a fool according to his folly. There are some people that that becomes a distraction to them and they're unable to listen. So I'm going to ask the admins here. Admins, please do me a favor. Focus on the trolls. Bounce them right away. Block them. Because I don't want to be a distraction to those brothers and sisters who do want to learn and love Jesus. Please, right? I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus so that we can just go into the meat of the matter and not go on tangents because we have some children of Satan attacking and then I have to go for the juggler. Right? Please do that, folks. Admins, please, if you can, so I don't have to deal with it. Okay, with that said, praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. We love your Son, the Lord Jesus. We love your Holy Spirit. Father, please forgive us for all our shortcomings, imperfections, and sins, and the stain of the flesh. Forgive me for failing you, even today, Father. Wash us in the blood of Jesus, and give us the power and life from your Holy Spirit to crucify the flesh, to walk in the life of the Spirit, filled with the fruit of the Spirit, to truly love you and obey you and fear you and enjoy you by delighting your heart in obedience, Father. May the Lord Jesus increase in us. May we decrease. Cover us with the blood of Jesus, Father. Cover our loved ones with the blood of Jesus, Father. Cover my daughters with the blood of Jesus and seal them and protect them and fight for them. And Lord, save us from these trials, Father, so that we can focus on glorifying you and provide for our daily needs. Father, anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. <clears throat> Constrain me from, <clears throat> from being unnecessarily offensive by the power of your Holy Spirit. And also, Father, save me from trying to be politically correct and tickle ears, Lord. And fill my lungs and my chest and throat with life from your spirit so I can have the health necessary to glorify you because you don't need me, Father. We need you. And Lord, please bless them to understand the things I say. And save me from error and strengthen us in the truth that comes from your spirit as your spirit enables me to rightly handle the word of truth for your glory, the glory of Jesus, your son. 
for the glory of your spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Have your way in Jesus' name. All right. I was asked to discuss, asked to discuss Satan in the book of Job, Job chapter 1 and 2, and Ezekiel chapter 28. I think I'm going to do Ezekiel 28 first. What do you think? That's the most controversial one. I'm going to get people upset. They're going to get upset at me, but hey, right? Oh, well, what can I do? Right? You guys want me to start with Ezekiel 20? Is Satan the anointed cherub of Ezekiel 28, 11 to 19? Now pray for me that the Spirit fills me. For the glory of Christ, and I do justice to this topic because, folks, and by the way, let me just let the cat out of the bag. These interpretations are not new. They're not novel. I didn't invent them. In my talk in Isaiah 14, I'm not the first one that has stated contextually Isaiah 14 is not about Satan. Ezekiel 28, what I'm about to say is not unique to me. It's a not, not a novel interpretation I came up with. It is interpretation that many mighty men and women of God have held to and have expounded and espoused throughout the centuries, right? So I don't want you to think these are my interpretations. I came up with them. Pretty much there's nothing new under the sun, right? What we're doing is, by the grace of God's Spirit, we are building on the foundation laid before us by the spiritual giants that came before us. We have 2,000 years of spiritual giants, warriors that the triune God have raised for the glory of Christ that have already plunged the depth of these scriptures and found these things and have spoken about these things and we're building upon their research, their writings, their preaching, and their life, right? So we don't take credit. All credit belongs to the triune God who has been faithful in building up the church of Jesus Christ for 2,000 years and doing so perfectly. Right? Everyone with me there? And thank our brother Protestant believer. He's going to be posting verses. But Protestant, you don't need to post this right now. I'll read it, okay? But before I read it, let me give you a link to the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible, okay? Let me give you the link to a Greek version, the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible. Thank our brother Protestant believer for helping me, me to help you. He'll be posting verses in a minute. And well, you know what? I'm trying to get there. I'm still 50 pounds away. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to work out here, which is why you can't see any tone. But I'm still gorgeous. Anyway, someone said, can you tone down on the mocking? Well, friend, I want people to know that the most joyful experience a person can have is to walk in fellowship with the triune God, to be in love with Jesus. Because in spite of the hell that may be breaking around you, because Jesus is real, he will sustain you with a joy and peace that words cannot describe. And yet people who are living life to the fullest apart from Jesus, living for their pleasures, a hedonistic lifestyle, they're all miserable, depressed, and hate life. Don't believe me? Why do you see so many of these people addicted to drugs and so many of them checking out and committing suicide if you could find true lasting pleasure in the world apart from Jesus. There is no lasting pleasure apart from the true source of pleasure, joy, and love, and peace. And that is the triumph God of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But anyway, save this link. Save this link because we're going to look at that in a minute. Now, I'm going to read the text for now. We're going to look at Ezekiel 28, 11 to 19. Ezekiel 28, 11 to 19. I'm going to read it. You just note it down because then from there... Our dear brother Protestant will be posting verses as the Lord grants me clarity and unction from the Spirit to handle these texts reverentially for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay, okay. I'm reading. Oh, let me read the modern English version, you know, which is modernized King James. Let me just read that, and we're going to go back to the authorized version. Okay, a lament for the king of Tyre. Ezekiel 20, 11, 19. Now I need your undivided attention. Not because I want attention for myself. I want you to focus on the word of God and give Jesus your all. Ezekiel 20, 11, 19. And by the way, I'm not saying that if you follow Jesus, you won't have trials, tribulations. In fact, I can assure you, if you follow Jesus, your trials and tribulations will be worse because now Satan will be coming after you to take you out. But I can assure you, because Jesus is more real than you can imagine, by his infinite power, he will cover you and preserve you that your trials will not consume you because there is no power to pluck you out of the love 
of Jesus Christ, from the love of Jesus Christ. Now, that said, Ezekiel 28, 11, 19. Moreover, the word of Yahovah came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says, in Hebrew, it's Adonai Yahovah, the Lord God, sovereign Yahweh, Yahovah. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, pay attention to where this king resided. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, we all know from Genesis chapter 2, the Eden's, Eden's on earth, right? It's not in heaven like the Muslims think. The garden of Eden was located somewhere in Mesopotamia, the exact location of which we no longer know because obviously after the flood, the demographics, the ge geographical landscape was drastically changed, right? And things were buried under debris. But put that aside. Garden of Eden, according to Genesis 2, is on earth. So whoever this king was, he was in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sargis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper. Much of these precious metals, I have no idea what they are or what they look like, right? The sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. And here's where people see Satan. Because of verse 14, they think this has to speak of satan before his fall you were the anointed cherub that covers and i set you there so you're a cherub that i set you in the garden of eden you're upon the holy mount of god you walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire you were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you by the multitude of your merchandise you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned therefore i have cast you as profane out of the mountain of god now by the way i want you to remember this part Right where it says, by the multitude of your merchandise. Remember this, because this is going to be mentioned in the first part of the chapter. By the multitude of your merchandise, you are filled with violence in your midst, and you sin. Therefore, I have cast you as profane out of the mountain of God. I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I cast you to the ground. I lay you before the kings that they may see you. You have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trade. So he was trading. Therefore, I brought fire out from your midst. In other words, when it says fire from your midst, because of your sin, it has now consumed you. Understand the language. Fire from your midst means your sin is the reason now you'll be consumed in wrath and destruction. Your sin is the cause of this fire that will now consume you. It has devoured you. And I've turned you to ashes upon the earth. Pay attention. I've turned you to ashes upon the earth. So this king, anointed cherub, has become ashes. And the sight of all those who see you, all those who know you among the people, are astonished at you. You are a terror and you shall cease to be forever. Okay, now let me ask some questions for you, folks. Okay, I want to ask some questions first. Okay. You've been taught that this is talking about Satan as the anointed cherub. And the reason why he fell from favor and was punished by God, right? Right? That's what you believe? This is talking about the origin of Satan and why he fell. All right. So this is talking about God's condemnation of Satan and why he fell, right? Okay, let me just ask some questions. And for the record, let me just be clear on this so people don't misunderstand. I am not denying that behind every human ruler, there is a spirit ruler working in and through that human agent. I'm not denying that. The Bible is quite clear. Human rulers have spirit beings that work through them, that operate through them, that influence them, if not possess them, right? That's in the Bible. Daniel 10, verse 13. Daniel 10, 20 to 21. Daniel 10, verse 13, Daniel 10, verses 20, 21, we are told that the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece opposed the angel sent to speak to Daniel, and that angel needed backup, needed Michael to help him fight these princes. Now, obviously, these are not human rulers because no human ruler can oppose an invisible angelic creature because unless that angelic creature makes himself visible, you can't see him. So a human ruler on earth can't oppose him and you know, stop him, right? So in Daniel 10, 13 and 20, 21, there we are told that the human ruler of Persia and the human ruler of Greece have spirit rulers, sp spirit princes working through them, operating through them, controlling them. 
right? Yep, Ephesians 6.12. That's why the Bible says our power is not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, dominions, and the heavenly realm. Okay. So I'm not saying that these human rulers are not influenced, controlled, even possessed by unclean evil spirits working through them. Is that clear? I'm not saying that. And thank Protestant he's posting it. So you understand what I'm not saying, right? So I'm not saying that the king of Tyre doesn't have a spirit ruler working through him, influencing him, corrupting him in order to corrupt others. Okay, I'm not saying that. But here's some questions I want you to just think about. Let me read again verse 18. You have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trade. Therefore, I've brought fire out from your midst. It has devoured you. And I've turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all those who see you. Can I ask you a question? If this is speaking of Satan, how do you turn Satan into ashes? Let me just ask you a question. How do you turn a spirit being into ashes? You want me there? Okay, you're saying this is Satan, but it says that this king will be turned into ashes. Uh, I crown you, you're not getting it. S Satan's spirit body isn't physical for it to be turned into ashes. Zarina, let me repeat it again. Satan's spirit body isn't physical for it to be turned into ashes. What are you guys talking about? Let's, let's think more deeply. By the power of the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit illuminates us, opens our eyes, let's think more deeply. I crown you. Can you show me where it says Satan has a physical spirit body? And that makes no sense. If it's physical, it's not merely spiritual. If it's spiritual, it's not physical. I'm not saying angels don't have material forms of some kind. Angels have spiritual shapes, but their shapes, their quote-unquote bodies are different. It's not made of the substance of the earth. So you don't call it physical. That's why Jesus Christ said in Luke 24, 39, a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. Angelic creatures are spirits, so they don't have physical bodies, flesh and bone bodies. They do have shapes and forms of some kind. They're not devoid of shape, but it's not physical, fleshly. Right? My second question for you to ponder on. Second question for me for you to ponder on. Who was Satan trading with? Does Satan actually trade? He trades goods? Did you, did you hear it? Let's read it again. Okay. You have defiled your sanctuaries by the multiple iniquities, by the iniquity of your trade. What does he trade? Who is he trading with? Does he barter and trade? I want you to just think. I don't want you to believe what I believe. I want you to believe what the Holy Spirit wants you to believe. All right? Zena, I don't care what they say. The text, does it say that? Notice, I can read into the text anything I want, Zena. Oh, trading your soul. He's the one trading, right? And why would I assume it's talking about bartering for the souls of human beings? Where do we get that? No, I know that, Zena. Zena, why are you getting animated? There's that Chaldean Assyrian in you. You get animated, you want to attack. Calm down. I'm the only one who can be angry. I'm an angry Assyrian. My point is... You have to read that into the text that it's trading and bartering for human souls. The plain reading of the text says nothing <clears throat> remotely to suggest that it's not about trading and bartering for human souls, right? In other words, you have to assume it's speaking of Satan to read that into the text, right? You have to assume it's Satan, then you have to read these things into the text. But if you just read it and no one told you it's Satan, would you walk away with the impression that's Satan? Now, the confusing part is Ezekiel 28, 14, right? The confusing part is Ezekiel 28, 14, because it says, you are anointed cherub that covers. So it's got to be a spirit creature, right? That's the confusing part. That's the part which would lead many to suggest it's not speaking merely of a human being, but a spirit creature working through the human being, right? Well, we're going to examine whether that's the case. But first, here's where I'm going to challenge that assumption. Ezekiel 28 in the Greek version. Did you know the Greek version is of Ezekiel 28 is the oldest extent version of Ezekiel 28 that we have? Did you know that? 
the Hebrew version of Ezekiel 28 is later than the Greek version. Are you with me there? The oldest extent version of Ezekiel 28 is the Greek version. The Hebrew version is way, way later, right? It's produced centuries after the time of Christ. Okay. So the oldest version of Ezekiel 28, the Greek version, and by the way, how many of you are Orthodox here from the Orthodox Church? Yep, Protestant, Meta to Harub. We're going to post it again. How many Orthodox here? Yep. No, well, the Greek version is what we call the Septuagint, Renee. Right? It's commonly referred to as the Septuagint, right? Any Orthodox here? Okay. Tony K, as an Orthodox, can you confirm that the Orthodox churches do not use the Hebrew Masoretic text, but they go with the Greek version of the Old Testament? The Orthodox church believes that the Hebrew Masoretic text of the Old Testament is a Jewish corruption that's not as faithful as the Greek version of the Old Testament. And in their Bibles and in their liturgy, they do not use the Hebrew Masoretic text type. They use the Greek version of the Old Testament, which they believe to be superior to the Hebrew. You with me there? You guys understand what I'm what I'm saying or no? Why is that? Now let's look what at what the Greek version, the English translation of the Greek version says about Ezekiel 28, 14. Arun, the Orthodox churches, particularly the Greek Orthodox, they follow the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Arun, follow with me. They follow the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The Greek version, in many places, does not agree completely with what's known as the Masoretic text Type of the Old Testament. It's called the Masoretic text type or the Masoretic Old Testament because there are a group of Jewish scribes around the fifth century after Christ, known as the Mesoretes, that would copy the Old Testament very meticulously, meaning very detailed, right? And so the extent Hebrew copies that we have up until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947, and there we found copies of the Old Testament in Hebrew that were. Composed anywhere from 200 to 200 years before the time of Christ. But up until the dis discovery of Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest Hebrew copies of the Old Testament were centuries after the time of Christ, like about 900 years after the time of Christ. You with me there? So when you look at the Greek versions of the Old Testament and what's known as the Masoretic textual tradition, there are differences. And with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have found that many of the readings of the Greek version, not found in the Hebrew, are actually confirmed by the Dead Sea Scrolls. Not in every place, but there are places in the Greek version that disagree with the Masoretic textual tradition, which the Dead Sea Scrolls confirms to be an older form of the Hebrew text. In other words, you'll read... Let's say Deuteronomy 32.43 in the Greek version. And it reads differently from what we call the Masoretic textual tradition. The Dead Sea Scrolls, when it was found in Deuteronomy 32.43, it contains the same reading that the Greek version has, which is not found in the Masoretic textual tradition. Do you know that? So there are places in which the Dead Sea Scrolls agrees with the Greek version over against the Masoretic Textual tradition, what we call the Masoretic text type. What do you mean, why is that, Zarina? You answer your own question. You answer your question. Why is that? How could it be otherwise? It That's what it is. <laughs> when you ask me why is that, it's like asking me, I got to be careful there. Why is the earth round? Well, it's not. Okay, why is the earth flat? Because that's the way it is. The Greek version is based on an older form of the Hebrew text, a form that underlies the Dead Sea Scrolls that differs in many places from the later Masoretic Hebrew textual tradition. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying these differences are such that you're going to get, get a different theology, a different story, a different Moses, a different Joshua. No, no, no. These variants are not such where the theology changes or the history changes, right? So, but the fact is, on our extent copies of the Bible, we do have variations. There are variant readings because prior to the printing press, copyists are going to make mistakes, whether intentional or unintentional, because you don't have a perfect copyist. Right? Now, before I move on, does everyone understand what I'm saying about the Greek version and what's known as the Mesoretic text type? The form of the Hebrew Old Testament that was copied and recopied and recopied by a group of Jews called the Mesoretes in the 5th century. Right? And in light of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have now found that some readings in the Greek version are actually older than what we find in the letter, le later Masoretic textual tradition. So there are readings in the Greek version that disagree with the Masoretic text type, but which agree with the Dead Sea Scrolls. In fact, let me shock you. In your Protestant Bible, which goes with the current Jewish Old Testament, you only have 150 Psalms, right? How many Psalms do you have? 150, right? Did you know that the Greek version of the Old Testament has 151 Psalms? 151 Psalms. And the Latin version also has 151 Psalms. And guess what, folks? So that 151 Psalm is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls have 151 Psalms. Agreeing with the Greek version and the Latin version. No, I'm not talking about Rene, about the splitting. The splitting would then give us 152. I'm talking about there's a psalm that's the 151st psalm, Psalm 151. That's found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and found in the Greek version and in the Latin version, but not found in the Masoretic textual tradition. Because the authorized version, for the most part, went with the Masoretic textual tradition. Who said it's been missing, Brian? Psalm 151 has always been there in the Greek version and the Latin version. It was never missing. It was always there as part of the church. You hear me there? It's always been part of the church. The Greek-speaking Christians have it. The Latin-speaking Christians have it, and the Dead Sea Scrolls also contained it. I don't know what modern translation you're talking about because most of the Protestant translations are based on the Masoretic textual tradition, right? But it's not missing in the Greek Orthodox Bible or in the Latin Vulgate. So when you say it's missing, missing from which Bible, from which denomination, Brian? The fact is you're Protestant and you've limited yourself only to Protestantism, right? Am I correct? You're a Protestant? By the way, I'm a Protestant as well. Yeah, their own Catholic Latin Vulgate would have it. You see how much information I have to share before I can even go into the topic? You see how much groundwork I have to lay before I even get into the topic? Is this stuff boring you? And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to protect me from error. In Jesus' name, I pray I'm not mistaken. If I am a correct enemy, not to repeat and save you from that. But is this helping you? Yep. So far, are you with me? I didn't confuse anyone. Let me sum up the discussion. We have different versions of the Hebrew Bible in different languages that are basically identical. Do not overemphasize the differences. The different versions of the Hebrew Bible are basically identical in that they'll give you the same theology, same teaching about God, same teaching about the Messiah, same teaching about the Holy Spirit, same teaching about salvation, same historical narrative, right? Same history. So I don't want you to think the difference are such. That means if I read the Greek version, I'm going to walk away with a different theology, Right? A different understanding of Old Testament history. No, you're going to get the same message. 
same view of God, same view of Messiah, same view of spirit, same view of the sacred history. God's working in time and space in history, right? Same view of the Jews. It's going to be the same. Don't overemphasize the differences where you think, oh, that's it. We're going to get a different theology. No. The beauty of these different versions, let me explain to you God's wisdom in allowing all these different versions. The beauty of these different versions lies in the following. What makes these different versions beautiful? One of the things that make these different ver versions beautiful is that it becomes a testimony of the human impossibility of corrupting the Bible so that the original readings of the Bible are lost. Why? Because all these versions are testimony that the Bible was spread wide and far, making it humanly impossible for any individual or clergy to get a hold of all the copies, to change those copies in such a way that we no longer have confidence to know what the original said. You get it? Because let's say the Greek copies were corrupted, but the Hebrew copies would not be corrupted in the same way, in the same places that the Greek copies were corrupted. Same thing with the Hebrew copies. Let's say the Jews corrupted the Hebrew in these places. Well, the Greek copies wouldn't be corrupted in the same way in the same places. And then you add the Latin, and then you add the Coptic, and on and on it goes. God in his wisdom made it humanly impossible for any individual or group of individuals to monopolize the manuscripts and change them so that we could not know what the originals actually read. And this is the beauty and the power of our God and a testimony to his faithfulness in making sure his Bible has been preserved prior to the printing press where you couldn't mass produce the Bible. Andy, I hope you didn't stumble. Did I cause you to stumble? I hope you're leaving because it's late, not because you're upset. Okay, now with that said, the Greek version of Ezekiel 28. God bless you, Andy, and preserve you. Do me a favor, Protestant believer. Post Ezekiel 28, 14 from the King James. I believe so, medic. The Lord Jesus fill you with his joy, Andy, and all of us as well. Ezekiel 28, 14 from... From the King James, which is based on the Masoretic text tradition, the Masoretic text type. Okay, read with me Ezekiel 20 14. Okay, read this. Here's what the Masoretic text type says in Ezekiel 20 14 Thou art the anointed cherub. So, you, King of Tyre, are the anointed cherub that covereth. So you are the anointed cherub. So according to this reading, he is the anointed cherub, right? And I have set thee so thou wast upon the holy mount of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Now post for verse 16. Verse 16. Verse 16. Zena, and I, everyone else, I hope you're following along. Choose Jesus, everyone else. I hope you're following along and you're learning and I'm not confusing you. Verse 16. Exactly, Donald. It's humanly impossible. By the multitude of thy merchandise, thy hath filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as a profane <clears throat> out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub. So here, he's the cherub, right? Zena, choose everyone. In the Masoretic text type, the Hebrew Old Testament, copied by the Masoretes, these Jewish scribes, in Ezekiel 20, 14, 16, the king is said to be the cherub, right? He is a cherub, right? Okay, now here. What about the Greek version, folks? Here it is in the Greek. Here it is in the Greek. Guys, read. Here's the shock. From the day that thou was created, thou was with the cherub. Bam! The Greek version says he was with the cherub. He's not a cherub. Here it goes again. Here's the link to the Greek version. Here's the link to the Greek version. Yep, it's growing and growing. In Jesus' name, we're going to get up to a 1,000. Yep, the Greek version, which is even older than the Hebrew Masoretic textual tradition. 
the Greek version, which at times retains an older form of the Hebrew Old Testament. Here it goes, verse 14, one more time. Click on link so you know I'm not making it up. Says that the king of Tyre was with the cherub. He's not a cherub. Here you go. Read it. Now let me read to you verse 16 in the Greek and really scratch your heads. You ready? Here it is, 16. Oh, but it's more than nine, right, darn it. Okay, let me, I got to cut it off. Therefore, thou hast been cast down, wounded from the mount of God, and the cherub has brought thee out of the midst of the stones of fire. Wow. The Greek version of 16 says, the cherub threw you out. You're not a cherub, but you were thrown out by the cherub that you were with. The cherub that you were with threw you out when you sinned. Did you get it? Post it one more time, first and last. God bless you, brother. Zarina got it. Bam! Zarina, you got it. Zarina, you got it. Zarina, she got it. Post it again. Guys, pay attention to the wisdom that Zarina has been given by the Spirit. Post what you just asked me, Zarina. She goes, so is this Adam? Bam. Exactly. The Greek version is saying that the king of Tyre was like Adam, who in the day that Adam was created was perfect, but because of pride, sin, and then was cast out of the Garden of Eden by the cherub. It's not that he's Adam, but he's being likened to Adam, who like Adam is a ruler, and like Adam, in his arrogance, wants to be like God. And like Adam, because of that sin, was punished and banished from God's presence. So he is not a cherub that was in the garden, but he's being likened to Adam who was with the cherub in the garden and then was cast out because of similar sin, the sin of thinking he was a God who could be like God. Did you catch it? No, the medic, the King James, based on the Masoretic text, does say the king is a cherub. No, you got it reverse, medic. Let's try it again. The King James, based on the Masoretic text, says he was the anointed cherub. The Greek version likens him to Adam, who was with the cherub. So you got it reversed. You got it now? So if I went with the Greek version, okay, Black Smurf, what I'm trying to say is if you go with the Greek version, the king of Tyre is not called a cherub. The Greek version says that he was with the cherub in the Garden of Eden. Did you get that so far, Black Smurf? If I had the Greek version, the Greek version is telling me the king of Tyre. Tyre was located by Lebanon, by the way, okay? Located by Lebanon. It's saying that king was with the cherub in the Garden of Eden. So the Greek version says he was with the cherub. He's not a cherub. Okay. Why? Because the Greek version is mocking him and likening him to Adam, who was actually in the garden, who was actually with the cherubim, who, like the king of Tyre, sinned in his arrogance because he wanted to be like God. Do you get it so far, Black Smurf? But if I go with the Hebrew, Hebrew Masoretic text type, the king is called a cherub. So now you have to debate which form of the Hebrew text is more accurate and faithful to the original. Well, that's a debate, isn't it? Okay, well, let me repeat it, Blacksburg, because I, I want you to get it. And because it's overwhelming, some of you, I'm going to repeat, re repeat it over and again. You did get the fact, Black Smurf, that the Greek version says that the king of Tyre was with the cherub. So he's not a cherub, right? No, yes, he did, Derek. He did eat it out of pride, the pride of wanting to be like God. Because if you go back, Derek, to Genesis 3, what was the sin of Adam and Eve? 
to be like God, independent from God, being their own God, doing their own thing. That's Genesis 3, 5 and 22. So, Derek, yes, it was. The, the pride of wanting to be like God and to also appease his wife, putting her above God, her interest above God's interests. You with me there, Derek? What was their sin? What did the serpent say? You will be like God when you eat, meaning you'll be your own God, Doing your own thing, not having to answer to God and be in submission to Him. So you with me there, Derek? Just want to make sure you're getting this. Yes, medic, you finally got it. Greek version says he's with the cherub. Mesorek says he is the cherub. Derek, I'm going to repeat myself a third time. And if you don't get it, brother, I don't want to bounce you. Was he there when the serpent told Eve, eat of the tree so you can be like God? Yes or no, Derek, because now you're arguing with me. Yes or no, Derek? See, this is what frustrates me when people don't listen because they want to pontificate and prove they're right. Okay. Let's try this again, Derek. Was Adam there? No. I'm not going to chill. I'm going to chill you out. Say, say something stupid and watch how you get blocked. Answer the question, Derek. Was he there? When the serpent said to both of them, the day you eat, you will be like God. Answer within 10 seconds, because I'm not going to tolerate this. Yeah. Okay, send this guy away, guys. Can you do me a favor? Block him, please. Admins, do me the honor. For the rest of you, for the rest of you. When the serpent approached Eve... Was Adam there listening to the conversation when the serpent said, in the day you eat, you shall be like God. The King James says like God's. There is no debate on this. Read it. Okay, so let's sum up Black Smurf. Let's sum up Black Smurf. God bless you, three ghosts. Okay. You, Yunus Ahmed, I'm not saying they corrupted it. That's the debate, Yunus Ahmed. Now he's saying, did the Mesorites corrupt the text? Well, that's the debate, right? Did the Mesorites retain the original reading of the Hebrew, or did the Greek do? The Greek retain the original form. See, that's the debate, Yunus. That's a debate I can't answer. Does the Greek version retain the actual wording of Ezekiel 28, or does the Hebrew version? Well, that's the debate, isn't it? Now, if you're committed let's say, to the authority of the Hebrew. Oh, here comes David Wood again. Oh, my goodness. Why are you listening in on me, man? I want to get to 1,000 one day soon, okay? But let's come back to the point. Listen to me. Uh, um, see, you made me lose my train of thought. Man, what a... Who asked me the question now? Oh, Eunice, yeah. That's the debate. If you're committed to the Hebrew textual tradition and you believe the King James is the perfect word of God in English, then you're going to accept the Masoretic reading. You with me there, Eunice? But if you're not committed to the Hebrew textual tradition and you believe that the Greek in places is more accurate and faithful to the original, then you're going to go with the Greek version. But that's a debate I can't settle for you, right? I can't settle for you. You with me there? Now, David, it'd be nice if you gave a shout out on your channel that I'm doing a live stream so we can get your thousand viewers to watch me. I'm a broke apologist, dude. You're 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 what we call you know mega bucks rolling in the money. Okay, now Black Smurf, follow with me. Black Smurf, follow with me. You you so far see that if you go with the Greek version, if you go with the Greek version, Black Smurf, there the king of Tyre is not a cherub. He was with the cherub in the Garden of Eden, right? Amen. We're all servants of Jesus. Right, Black Smurf? Okay. So if you go to the Greek version, then what's happening here is God is mocking the king, likening him to Adam, who fell for a similar reason. You with me there? In other words, the king is like Adam in that Adam was also a king. We don't have the reading in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Jeremy. That's the problem. The copy of Ezekiel in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we don't have the Ezekiel 28, 14, and 16. Otherwise, I could answer that question. That's the problem, Jeremy. But now coming back 
to, to Black Smurf. Okay. Now, if you go to the Greek version, then there, the king is being likened to Adam because like Adam, he's a king. Because remember, wasn't Adam given the, the authority to have dominion over the earth? So Adam was a king, right? So like Adam, he was a king. Okay, well, hold on. His guy wants me to mention something. In David Wood's recent video, Michael Jackson meets meets Muhammad. Muhammad meets Michael Jackson. Michael keeps saying, Shamon, Shamon. And in the video, he says, what? Did you say Shamon? Say Shamon, the Syrian Encyclopedia? This is David's way of preparing for me being in Muhammad's boom, boom room, where Muhammad's going to go boom because of the Syrian Encyclopedia, baby. Bam, Shamo, Shamo, because even Michael Jackson knew I'm the greatest apologist in the 21st century. In fact, Michael Jackson was more a prophet than Muhammad because Michael Jackson prophesied Shamo, Shamo, like you can find Muhammad in the Song of Solomon, you will find Sam Shamoon in Michael Jackson's lyric, Shamo, Shamo. That means that man was prophetic, baby. Right? Okay. We got it? That's actually David's way of advertising future sessions in which Sam Shimon's going to appear in Muhammad's Boom Boom Room. And also Halal Hogan's going to appear in Muhammad's Boom Boom Room. And the Black Stone, the speaking, breathing Black Stone is going to appear in Muhammad's Boom Boom Room. Lord Jesus willing. And guess who's going to be performing all three? Yours truly. Okay, now, yep, in time, virtual. Keep praying God will provide and protect us, and I'll be there making special appearances in Muhammad's boom boom room. Michael Jackson, you a prophet and a poet. We know it. You prophesied the coming of the Assyrian Encyclopedia. You kept shouting for me, player. Shamo, Shamo. You know how they say the Muslims say that the Jews are praying, oh Allah, bring. Uh, Muhammadim, Michael Jackson was praying, God, bring Shamo. We wait for Shamo. It's your birthday. It's your birthday. Go, Shamo. All right, anyway. I'm going crazy. Okay. <laughs> you know, David Wood is a jerk, but he's my jerk. And I love that jerk. I would rather die than. Live without my jerk, David Wood. Maybe uh, all right. With all that, that's right. Choose Jesus. Even heal the world was uttered in antip anticipation of my coming. So when he was singing Shamon, it's not a coincidence. Afterwards, he sent heal the world because he knew that I'd be sent by Jesus to heal the world. Heal the world, make it a better place for you, for me. And it. All right, that's enough. Let's get back. Let's get back. Are we ready? Okay. Let's get back. Okay. With that comedy interlude, because we got Curly joining us, and I ain't Curly. David Wood, when he shaves his head, will be Curly splitting image. But anyway, coming back to the issue, Black Smurf. Coming back to the issue. You understand if you go with the Greek version, everyone else help, help me to help you. Did you understand if I go with the Greek version... The king is not a cherub. He was with the cherub in the Garden of Eden. Why? Because God is mocking the king and reminding the king that his fall resembles the fall of Adam. Why? Because like Adam, he's a king. Like Adam, in his arrogance, he wants to be like God. And like Adam, he fell under God's judgment. Right? So the Greek version... You don't have the king being a cherub. The Greek version, the king is likened to Adam who also fell because of a similar sin. You get it? Everyone understand what happens if you go with the Greek Greek version? Donald, yes, you can actually buy a copy of the Old Testament translated into English on 
uh, based on the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's called the Dead Sea Scrolls in translation. Okay, now, but folks, let me bring out the implication of that. If you go with the Greek version of Ezekiel, that king is not the devil. You would have to argue that he's actually Adam reincarnated. You with me there? So the Greek version, and Jeremy, you need to hear this. The Greek version identifies the king of Tyre as Adam. So why don't you argue that that's Adam reincarnated? Or at least the spirit of Adam possessed his body. I hope, medic, we do, because we may. We don't know. In time, we may find older copies than the Dead Sea Scrolls. You never know what God will allow us to discover. You understand that if you go to the Greek version, follow with me, Zena and everyone else. The Greek version, the king is no longer said to be a cherub. The Greek version likens the king to Adam. So then the most you prove is either the king is Adam reincarnated or Adam's spirit soul inhabited the body of the king of Tyre. Now, which one of you would argue that way? The Lord Jesus protect you in Florida, and the Holy Spirit be your covering. So the Greek version, are you with me there? The Greek version means that the king is not a cherub. The king is being likened to Adam. Now, obviously, he's not literally Adam, and obviously, he wasn't literally in the Garden of Eden, right? So it is not meant to be taken literally. You are not literally in the garden. But I am <clears throat> likening you to Adam in the garden who was perfect in all his ways and was a king and was lavished with extreme beauty but in his pride corrupted himself and sinned and fell from favor like you. So what was the common link between Adam and him? Both of them wanted to be like God. And I'll show you that when we read Ezekiel 28, 1 to 10. Is that clear? Because I need to move on to the second part. Thank you, Brian. You got it. It's not meant to be literal. Yes, Black Smurf, you got it. It's not meant to be literal. See, Set You is not listening. Can we send Set You on his merry way? He hasn't been listening at all. So people here wasting time, send them on their merry way. Okay, it's not literal. Now, what if we go with the Masoretic textual tradition? Yes, Jeremy, God is mocking him because he's nothing but a man, a maggot, whom God is going to kill de dead. That's why you never read 11, 19 in isolation from verses 1 to 10. Okay? You never read, Jeremy, Ezekiel 20, 11, 19 in isolation from verses 1 to 10. Some people will tell you it's speaking of two different kings. The human king in verses 1 to 10 and the spirit ruler in verses 11 and 19. But that's begging the question. Yes, Black Smurf, 100%. Nebuchadnezzar was struck dumb like an animal. Okay, now, what if we go with, what if we go with the view that he is called the anointed cherub? Let's accept the Hebrew Masoretic textual tradition as accurate. After all, that's the reading found in our English translations, the chief of which is the King James, which over 300 years was the chief Bible for English-speaking Christians, right? For English-speaking Christians. Middle East for Christ, why would they? When the reading, you were an anointed cherub, is the reading found in the Hebrew copies of the Old Testament produced by the Mesorites. There's no need to correct it. Both readings are there. The debate is which one is original. And we're not going to solve that debate. Right? We're not going to solve that debate. But can we go with Ezekiel 28, 11 to 19, as found in the Old Testament copies produced by the Mesorites, where the king is said to be anointed cherub? Can we go with that reading? Would that prove that he's the devil? Would that prove that he's the devil? If we went with the reading, anointed cherub, would that prove he's the devil? No, it wouldn't. You don't need to post all of it, Protestant believer. What we're going to do now, we're going to read the first 10 verses. You can post them, Ezekiel 28, verses 1 to 10. You post them, and I'll read them. I'll go here and I'll read. You guys, he's going to post the King James. I'll read the modern English version, all right? Okay, let's read. Let's start. 
I'm reading modern English version, which is modernized King James, right? He's going to post. Let's read. Pay attention. Pay attention. The word of Yahovah came again to me saying, Son of man, say to the leader of Tyre, thus says Adonai Yahovah, the Lord Yahovah, right? Watch the language, folks. Because your heart is lifted up and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods. Notice. He is a human being, a human ruler who says, I'm a God. I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not God. You are a man and not God, right? Though you set your heart as the heart of God. Now here's the key, folks. Verse 3. You are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that is a match for you. Okay, folks. Here Ezekiel is referring to his contemporary Daniel. Be blown away with this. Ezekiel, Daniel are contemporaries. Daniel is in the court of the king prophesying by the spirit. Ezekiel is within the common folk in Babylon prophesying by the spirit. And Daniel's reputation is such that God mentions Daniel to Ezekiel, two contemporaries. You with me there? Ezekiel, by inspiration, is confirming his colleague, Daniel, in the court as a prophet of God, filled with wisdom. But can I ask you a question, folks? Can I ask you a question? Do you think God literally meant this wicked, evil, pagan human ruler was wiser and smarter than his prophet Daniel? Than his servant Daniel was filled with the Holy Spirit? This is verse 3. Post verse 3 in the King James Version, Protestant believer. God says to this wicked, evil human ruler, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that is a match for you. Really? God meant that? Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. And the King James is beautiful. There is no secret that they can, they can hide from thee. So wait. God is saying to the king, you're much wiser than my servant Daniel, a holy servant of mine filled with my spirit. And you're omniscient because there's no secret hidden from you. Really? He meant that literally? He's not even a prophet, Jacob. He's a wicked, evil, human, pagan ruler that God is going to kill dead. So are you guys seeing it? You think God meant that literally? Man, you are smarter than my servant Daniel. No secret can be hidden from you. You're omniscient. Okay, now, folks, wh why did I have you read verse 3? If verse 3 is obvious mockery, he's making fun of him. He's mocking him. And by the way, that tells you God mocks people. So if someone tells you you're not being Christ-like when you mock people, say, what Bible are you reading? God himself mocks people. His prophets mock people. Jesus on earth mocked people and used sarcasm. So did the apostles. What Bible are you reading? Which is why David Wood will go down in history as the greatest mark, mocker of them all. Okay, now my, my, my question to you is this. If obviously God is mocking Daniel, I'm sorry, not Daniel, Lord forgive me, he's your servant. If God is obviously mocking the king, then why do you believe that God is being serious with the king when he says you're an anointed cherub in the Garden of Eden? Why would you take that serious and not see it for what it is, Mocking him. Did you catch it? If verse 3, you won't take as being serious. God is mocking him. You're wiser than Daniel. That's how great you are. Oh, you're a God? You're wiser than Daniel. No seeker can be hit. You're omniscient. Man, who doesn't know that about you? This is the problem when reading a text. You cannot decipher the mood of the speaker. Is he mocking? Is he being sarcastic? Is he being serious? So you have to read carefully and prayerfully. Yep, God does have a sense of humor. Where do you think sense of humor came from? Not from him. So folks, do any of you take verse 3 seriously? God really meant it? Or do you see it for sarcasm? That he's mocking him. You fool. You arrogant human maggot you think you're god surely then you're smarter and better than daniel and omniscient no you're not you're nothing but a maggot and i'm going to kill you dead so then why would you take 
why would you take verses 14, 16 as literal, that God is saying you were an actual literal anointed cherub as opposed to mocking him? Oh, you're a God? Surely you're a spirit creature, an amazing spirit creature. You're an anointed cherub. You were there in the garden. You were amazing to look at. Amazing. And then pride was found in you, sin, and now I'm going to kill you dead. You see the problem with taking the language of Ezekiel 28 literally? Even when he likened to Adam, that too wasn't literal. It was a form of mockery. Right? Right? Because Adam was perfect when he was created, not the king. The king of Tyre was at no time perfect. Adam was in the garden, not the king. So is that clear so far? You see how hard it is to make a case this is Satan? You see how hard it is to make a case that this is Satan? Okay, now let me read the rest of it. That was verse 3. With your wisdom and with your understanding, you have attained riches for yourself and have attained gold and silver into your treasuries by your great wisdom, by your trade. You remember that word trade, folks? You remember I said Ezekiel 28, pay attention to the word trade. Here it is again. By your great wisdom, by your trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Now, can I ask you a question? Help me understand all with all seriousness. If this is referring to the fall of Satan... The only human couple at that time would have been Adam and Eve, right? The only human couple at that time would have been Adam and Eve, correct? If this is referring to the fall of Satan. Okay, now help me understand. Let me read verse 4 again. With your wisdom, with your understanding, you have obtained riches for yourself and have obtained gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom, by your trade, you have increased your riches. I'm reading 5. And your heart is lifted up because of your riches. How could he get rich by trading with people when the only human people on earth was Adam and Eve? Who was he trading with that got him rich? Who was he trading with that got him so rich and wealthy? Because if you're telling me this is talking about the fall of Satan, when he fell, the only human couple on earth was Adam and Eve. Seek the truth. Do you believe that when God created Adam, he created him imperfect? So then when God created all things initially, they were imperfect? So when God looked at creation and said very good, it meant very bad because they were imperfect? Seek the truth? Real quickly, I want you to answer. Oh, okay. All right, then send him on his merry way. He doesn't need to be here. All right, let's go. let's let's go back. Okay, let's finish it. Let's finish it. That was five. Therefore, thus says <clears throat> Adonai Yehovah. Watch. This is six, and we're going to read to ten. Because you have set your heart as the heart of God, therefore I will bring strangers upon you, the most cruel of the nations, the Babylonians and their cohorts. And they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your brightness. They shall bring you down to the pit, and you shall die the death of those who are slain in the midst of the seas. Will you yet say before him who slays you, I am a god? Although you are a man and not God, in the hands of those who wound you, do you see the mockery? When the sword is about to strike you and kill you dead like a human maggot, will you look at the one who's about to kill you and say, hey, 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 I'm a God, man. What are you doing? You can't kill a God. I'm a God. Let me read nine again. Will you say before him who slays you, I am a God? Although you are a man and not God, in the hands of those who wound you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken, says Adonai Yehovah. Now let's continue reading. It doesn't stop. See, now people have to break it down two sections. Verses 1 to 10. See, that's about the human ruler. Verses 11 19, it's about the spirit ruler. Oh, really? Let's read it now. Let's now continue reading. Moreover, see again, God wasn't finished with the king of Tyre. Here's a further word of judgment against the king of Tyre, whom God is very angry with. Moreover, the word of Yahovah came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say, and say to him, Thus says Adonai Yahovah. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Is he being literal here? Is it literal? See, now here's the question. In verse 3, he says, You are wiser than Daniel. 
No secret can be hid from you. It's not literal. Why do you then take this literally? Why don't you see it for what it is? God mocking him again. Oh, yeah, you are the seal of perfection, man. Perfection, we got to look you up. No one can compare. You are perfection, dude. Man, you're full of wisdom, perfect. Why would we take this literally? You with me there? Let's continue. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Literally, every precious stone was your covering. Literally, the sarge, sarges, topaz, and diamond, and beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the car carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub that covers. Now again, if you take it for mockery, this means... God is not saying you were actually in the Garden of Eden and you're actually anointed cherub. But he's mocking him and saying you were perfect like an anointed cherub. Right? You were perfect like these spirit creatures because you think you're God. You were, In other words, he's likening him to a creature that is beautiful, that is wise, that is powerful, not because he's actually a God or a spirit creature by way of mockery. It can be. You can say he's addressing the spirit that is within him, which I'm going to address next. But you understand how hard it is to make this a reference to Satan in light of all that we've just learned? The Greek version, the contextual meaning. You see how hard it is? So now, but what, what if someone says, okay, now, hold on. All right, I, I get it. Yeah, the Greek is good. I didn't say it's bad. I get it. Okay, but still, he can now be addressing the spirit that possesses him, which is possible. Because remember what I said? The Bible is quite clear. Behind every wicked human ruler, there is an evil spirit working in and through him, if not possessing him, right? And one sure sign of Satanism that you're under satanic influence is that you think you're a god. Because what was the first satanic temptation? Tempting Adam and Eve to be like God. So anyone who thinks he's a god or like God, you know he's under the influence of Satan and or an unclean spirit. Okay, now, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. Let's assume it is referring to Satan within him. Then you can't use Isaiah 14 anymore about Satan. You know why? You know why you can't use Isaiah 14 anymore about Satan? If Ezekiel 28 is about Satan, then Isaiah 14 is not. And I've already demonstrated it's not. But you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have both of them. You know why? Because in Isaiah, that being is thrown down from heaven to the earth because he ascended to heaven. But in Ezekiel 28, that being is on earth and his sin is in the garden when he's expelled. He doesn't go to heaven. So did Satan sin on earth and become imperfect or did he sin in heaven and become imperfect? When and where did Satan sin? Okay, you're saying heaven, right, Zena? But Ezekiel 20, 11, 19 says in the Garden of Eden on earth. So which is it? Did Satan rebel against God in heaven and was punished? Or was he in the Garden of Eden and it was in the Garden of Eden that he sinned and was punished? Because the Garden of Eden is on earth. No, medic, I'll give you a million dollars if you show me that says Satan, his pride was, his sin was pride in heaven. Where does it say pride in heaven? That's the whole point, Sam Price. I'm trying to stretch out your mind by the power of the Holy Spirit, trusting the Spirit to guide me to speak truth without error so that you can be challenged to go much deeper into the text. So this is my point. Either now you're going to tell me, either now you're going to tell me, Jeremy and everyone else, Satan was a cherub in the garden, 
and on earth is when he fell from favor because it was on earth he sinned, or he sinned in heaven so that Ezekiel 28 cannot be about him. You with me there? Is it, you understand my point? So how do I take Ezekiel 28? Here's how I take it. Now, let me repeat, because people come and say you're wrong and they want to change my mind. Don't waste my time. If you want to believe it's about Satan, that's fine. You're entitled to it. That doesn't mean it's a false view. It's a damnable view. Okay, but now let me tell you my take on Ezekiel 28. It's not literal. It is mockery. God is mocking the king of Tyre, mocking him, describing him as if he was an anointed cherub, as if he was in the Garden of Eden, as if he was perfect. I don't take it literally. I take it God mocking him, humiliating him, making fun of him, shaming him. You with me there? That's my take. You with me? That's my take. Love you too. But even if you want to say it's Satan, okay, let's go there. Now, write down these chapters. We're not going to read them tonight. I will do a session in which I think, let me repeat again, I think you can make an inference that Satan may have been a cherub, but it's not explicit. Follow with me. It's not explicit. Belteshazzar, I just told you I could care less if you disagree. Don't chime in and pontificate because you won't be able to prove your position. Which part of it's not literal? You again assume it's literal, therefore it can't be the human king. Really? Did, were you here for my discussion on the Greek version? The Greek version of the Old Testament says the king isn't a cherub. The king was with the cherub. The king was walking with the cherub. He's not a cherub. Don't be a Johnny come lately and chime in too late if you haven't heard the entire discussion. Because now you're speaking in ignorance. Okay? Be humble or you will get humble. Now let's come back to the issue. All right. Lord willing, I will do a session in which you can make an inference, an inference, but it's not explicit, it's not black and white, that Satan may have been a cherub, may have, may have been a cherub, but it's not explicit, it's an inference. Lord willing, do you want me to do a session on that? Do you want me to do a session in which we can infer that Satan possibly was a cherub? Okay, I'll do that. Now, if you believe Satan is a cherub, here's the thing, though. Here's another thing I want you to think about, ponder on, and reflect. Write down, we can't look at these chapters. Write down Isaiah chapter 6. Write down Ezekiel chapter 10. Possibly, Rick, I don't know. Because I said it's an inference. It's not black and white explicit. Read at your own leisure tonight during the week, Isaiah chapter 6, Ezekiel chapter 10. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 10. Yes, I'm covering Ezekiel 28. I've been doing it for over an hour. And then read Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Okay? Read those chapters. Why? You with me there? Read those chapters. Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 10, Revelation 4 and 5. You know why? Because the seraphim of Isaiah 6... Listen to this because you got to get this. The seraphim of Isaiah 6, the cherubim of Ezekiel 10, are described by John in Revelation as the four living creatures. John says the seraphim of Isaiah 6 and the cherubim of Ezekiel 10 are one of the same group of creatures, class of spirit creatures. They are the four living creatures. You with me there? So the seraphim, that's another name for the cherubim, the seraphim are the cherubim. The cherubim are the seraphim. And they're the four living creatures encircling the throne in Revelation 4 and 5. Why is that important? Why is that important? Why is that important? They are the four living creatures encircling the throne, Revelation 4 and 5. 
It's important because in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, if you read it carefully, there are three groups of spirit creatures in heaven. Three groups of spirit creatures. The 24 elders on 24 thrones, the four living creatures, and the angels. So in Revelation 5, the four living creatures are not angelic creatures. They're different. They're distinguished. They're separate. So if Satan is a cherub slash seraph, that he is not one of those angels. He's a different kind of spirit creature, even different from Michael and Gabriel, because Michael and great Gabriel are not cherubim, are not seraphim, they're angels. Jacob, because you came late, please don't pontificate, because I just explained Ezekiel 28 is not about Satan. You with me there? So if Satan is a cherub, and not because of Ezekiel 28, listen to me, Jacob, everyone else. Ezekiel 28 is not the text you point to to show that he was a cherub. Someone mentioned it. The seraphim, the word saraf, also refers to serpents. And in Numbers 11, we are told fiery serpents bit the Israelites. And in Hebrew, they're called ha-nachashim ha-sarafim. Ha-nachashim ha-sarafim. The word nachash, serpent, is used of Satan in Genesis 3. But I'll unpack that in the future if the Lord Jesus wills. No, it doesn't say he's an angel of light. He masquerades as an angel of light. He appears as an angel of light, but that's not his nature. The fact that he appears as an angel of light, masquerades as an angel of light, means he's not an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. Let's read 13, 15 for context. 2 Corinthians 11, 13, 15 for context. Watch here. I have Belteshazzar. I have. I know he tries to argue that. But it's assumption, it's not proof, and it's inferences, Belteshazzar, that he is making on the basis that the that the king is said to be a shining one. And he assumes that Nachash shares the same root where we get the word shining one. Belteshazzar, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. And not everything that Heiser says is gospel truth. I've written a series of posts refuting his claim that the heavenly council are divine beings. So unless you believe Michael Heiser is inspired, he's like the Apostle Paul, don't be a Heiserite, just like I condemn people for being Wit Wittians. Don't be a Shemunian. Don't be a Wittian. Don't be a Heiserite. Don't be a Woodian. What do I mean? Don't blindly follow David Wood. Don't blindly follow Anthony Rogers. Don't blindly follow James White, because I call his followers who blindly follow him Wittians. Sola Wittia, only White. Widians, don't be a Heiserite. In fact, I've noticed this. You got some, some followers of Heiser who make some of the followers of James White look humble in comparison in their nastiness and fascination with Michael Heiser. Don't be a Shemunian. Don't be a Woodian or a Rogerian or a Heiserite or Heiserian or a Widian. Be a Biblicist. And swear allegiance to the triune God and him alone. I give people enough reason not to follow me blindly because of my, my issues. Okay. You can be a Shemunian if you were following Halal Hogan. If you're following Halal Hogan and you're all about Shemunia, Shemuna mania, or Sharia mania then that's okay. Okay. After all, even Michael Jackson prophesied my coming when he kept saying, Shamo, Shamo. And then he sang the song in anticipation of my coming. Heal the world. Make it a better place. Oh. Come on, ladies. You don't get more talented than this. I'm bald. I'm beautiful. I can sing. I'm charming. What's up? Anyway. All right. So what's the point? If you read Ezekiel chapter 10, along with Isaiah chapter 6, along with Revelation chapters 4 and 5, 
The cherubim are the seraphim. The seraphim are the cherubim. And they're distinguished from angelic creatures. Therefore, if the devil, the serpent, is a cherub, a seraph, then he's not an angelic creature. He's a different type of creature. He's even different from Michael and Gabriel who are angels. Right? And 2 Corinthians 11, 13 of 15, the fact that Satan transforms himself as an angel of light means he's not an angel of light by nature. Let's read it. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now notice what he's saying here. These false apostles are not true apostles. They appear as true apostles. They masquerade as true apostles, but they're not true apostles. Any more than Satan is actually an angel of light. Right? And isn't it interesting? Folks, I'm going to end it now because we did a two-hour session. Lord willing, I'll be back on tomorrow. You guys want me back on tomorrow? Lord willing? To talk about Satan and Job? Chapters 1 and 2? Okay. Here's what's interesting, folks. Are you aware that Satan is never called an angel in the Bible? Rebel Mark, you don't want me here? I won't be here. It's okay then. Because of you, I won't be here. Are you aware Satan is never called an angel in the Bible? Not once. Satan is said to have angels, but he's never said to be an angel. Let me show you where it says Satan has angels. Okay? Let me show you where it says Satan has angels. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Yes, Michael's called an archangel. Jude chapter 1, verse 9, the archangel Michael. Right? And Luke 1 says, the angel Gabriel, Luke 1, 26. 2 Corinthians 1, 12, 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there is given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest should be exalted above measure. The word messenger there is angelos. That's the word where we get angel. That's why other translations say the angel of Satan, an angel from Satan was sent to torment me. Revelation 12, 7 to 8. Revelation 12, 7 to 8. Not yet. I'm going to do a series on proof on why Jesus can't be the Archangel Michael. Yes, the Greek word, Rene, angelos, means messenger. But that's where we get the word angel from. It simply means messenger. An angel is a messenger. That's it. He can be a spirit creature who's a messenger or a human creature who's a messenger or Jesus Christ, God Almighty, who's the Father's messenger. Even the Holy Spirit, who's God Almighty, can be the Father's messenger. Now, Revelation 12, 7 to 8. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. You got it? Satan, the dragon, has angels, but he's not called an, an, uh, an angel. Nor is he called a cherub. Nor is he called a seraph. So I'm not saying he's not an angel any more than I'm saying he's not a cherub any more than I'm saying he's not a seraph. What I'm saying is the Bible nowhere comes out and says, Satan, the angel, Satan, the cherub, Satan, the seraph, doesn't say it. You with me there? He's a spirit creature that rebelled, who's called a serpent, a dragon, the devil, right? But remember what I said, Deuteronomy 29, 29. Let's end it with this because I'll do part two tomorrow. Lord Jesus willing, same bad time, same bad channel. Lord willing, tomorrow I'm going to do Satan in the book of Job. Job chapter one and two. Okay. Deuteronomy 29, 29. A reminder, reminder for all of you. Read this. Post it again. Deuteronomy 29, 29. I'll try to be on 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is New York time. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Read with me, folks. Read. The sacred things belong unto Yahovah, our God. 
But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Zarina, you got it. Well, are you in the UK, Zarina? Uh, you got to check. I don't know. Okay. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Guys, did you hear what it said? It said, the sacred things belong to our God. The revealed things belong to us and our children. In other words, if it's secret, it's none of your business. If it's not revealed, it's none of your business. If it's not mentioned in God's revelation, none of your business. You with me there? So, does the Bible tell us Satan was an angel? No. Does it tell us he was a cherub? No. Does it tell us that he was a seraph? No. Then who is he? I can make an inference and suggest he may have been a cherub, but I can't prove it. And what exactly was the nature of his sin? We're told that his sin was pride, but the pride of what? What was he pride about? We're not told. If we're not told, none of your business, none of my business. Exactly, Renee. None of your business, none of my business. And because people wanting to know the things that God has been silent on, they have fallen into snares because they have searched out hidden revelation to find out who Satan is and open doors to demonic oppression and possession. You get it? So, I hope you're blessed. I've given you my position about Ezekiel 28. Let me repeat so you don't remember again. Do not bombard my comment section with 50,000 word posts. I'm going to block you. I don't read lengthy posts. I don't have time. I'm busy. But let me tell you what. Here. My position is Ezekiel 20 is not literal. It's not literally a spirit creature who was an anointed cherub. Therefore, I don't take it as a reference to the fall of Satan. Okay. However, if you want to believe Ezekiel 20 is about Satan in that it's speaking about the being that's possessing the human king of Tyre, working through the human king of Tyre, so goes up beyond him to that spirit being, more power to you. You want to accept it? That's fine. Many believe it. It's not a false teaching if you accept that or reject it. It's one of those doctrines we can agree to disagree and focus on the things that matter, right? Things that matter. Ruben, because I just don't like trolls who want to be argumentative, and you're one of them. You're going to get blocked too. So make my day and comment in the comment section, okay? It does not matter. So if you disagree with me, fine. Don't tell me you disagree with me because that means you want to fight with me and argue with me. I know there are people disagree with me. Fine. Keep it between you and God. If I'm mistaken, God corrected in me not to repeat it, save you from all errors, and if I speak in the truth by the power of the Holy Spirit, may the Holy Spirit confirm it in our hearts to know this truth, to proclaim this truth, to walk in this truth, to love the truth and die the, for the truth. Because our God is truth, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and we love our God. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Guys, I got a big trial within 60 days. Pray God saves me out of it miraculously. So I can continue to do ministry and save me financially. And that the Lord will give me the gift of contentment to keep fighting the fight. Trusting he's fighting for my girls and I will be with them sooner than later. And if the Lord is pleased, if he wants me to walk this journey alone, his will be done. But if he has someone set for me for ministry, pray for that godly partner to be real. So we can do ministry for the glory of Christ. Christ is risen, risen indeed. We love you, Jesus. See you tomorrow, God willing. Amen. Amen. Pray and fast for me, folks. Hit that like button, subscribe, and pass it on to others.